Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you for being here on behalf of Irwin's family. I want to express their uh, gratitude, their thanks to you for your presence here today and for all the prayers and thoughts and words that you have offered to them over these past several days. Uh, they appreciate your condolences. And so thank you for gathering today as we want to uh, celebrate and give thanks for the life of Irwin Home. Uh, and this is wonderful to see so many people be here for that. So thank you and may you be blessed in this time of remembrance and this time of celebration. We will begin our worship service, so I would invite you please to rise with me that we can gather with our opening hymn, Beautiful Savior. Please rise.
cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Revelation 21, 1-6 Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down of out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. I will dwell with them. They will be his people, so that God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Friends in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to begin by saying, Ingrid and family, that uh, we do pray God's grace and God's peace be upon you. And uh, from your church family, that uh, in the days that lie ahead, you know that you can call us and that we will be there for you as best we can. And uh, that we also mourn with you. He's a dear brother in Christ, and uh, we will miss him along with you. So may God grant peace to you. And to everyone who has come here today as well, that is part of why we are here today, to celebrate certainly, but to be able to turn ourselves over to God. That we might experience that depth of peace that is a part of the promise that comes from God to us. And maybe you're a little bit like me. Um, you kind of expect that things are supposed to start and stop on schedule. I'll give you an example. You're driving your car, you pull into your garage, you turn off the key and the motor keeps running. That ain't right. You know, you gotta get it to the mechanic, right? It's supposed to stop when you turn off the key. Or you're, you're listening to the radio. I don't know if people still do that, I guess, but you're listening to the radio and you turn it off and you pull out the plug and music still comes. Something's wrong, right? We have this expectation that things are supposed to happen on a certain schedule or in a certain way. However, if you have a child, perhaps, and that child is upset and crying, you shouldn't expect that the child will immediately stop crying just because you come and take it into your arms and try to offer comfort. Or a big jet airplane that is coming for a landing and taxis into the, to the terminal it takes a little while for those big turbines to wind down. For a while now, you and we have watched Irwin wind down. And I'm sure that in the midst of all of that, we had some expectations or some thoughts about how that was supposed to go. And that could leave us hurting, grieving even before Irwin left us and died, angry. There's a whole range that can come upon us. That's normal. As we watch somebody else wind down, we wind up very often. And that's why I want to say today that there are promises that have power for us today. There's a promise of peace that we heard about in our readings today. That wonderful song, it's, it's so well known and there's a reason it's so well known. It speaks of a savior, it speaks of a shepherd who seeks out his sheep, and who knows them. And as you walked this past week to the valley, to the edge of that valley of the shadow of death, you didn't send Irwin through it by himself. The Savior was there to guide him through, to take him home. The Savior has walked with Irwin his whole life long. We can celebrate that. We can give thanks. The Savior has prepared a place for Irwin and for all of those who know him and trust him, a place of rest and a place of peace. So I hope that rests in your heart. First of all, to know that Erwin is at peace now. He rests in the arms of the one who loves him. 
And then we can begin, I hope, to heal out of that a little bit. There's this wonderful passage in Psalm 23 that talks about the Savior preparing a table in the presence of my enemies. Now, I, I got to know Irwin a little bit in my time here, uh, and I can't imagine Irwin having an enemy. I just, it, I just can't imagine it. I don't know, maybe he failed some people in math at university in there. Hold it a grudge, possibly, I don't know. Maybe he has some enemies. But the image of that, setting that table, it's about fellowship. It's about turning enemies into friends. In the ancient world, if you broke bread with somebody, you entered into a covenant with them. You said, now we are friends. Now I will have your back and you will have mine. And that's what this talks about. And so in fact, I want to share a little story with you about Erwin because Erwin was my very first contact with this congregation, Trinity Lutheran. I've been a pastor here for about eight and a half years, and I went through the call process with different people. But back in the late 90s, when I was just a wet-behind-the-ears student, Irwin called me up and asked if he could talk to me a little bit. And he asked me, he gave me work, I guess professors tend to do that, but he told me, can you put together a biographical statement about yourself? Because we're thinking about pastors, we're thinking about people maybe to come and be here at Trinity. I had a wonderful conversation with him. And you know what? A man of, of gentleness, a man of quietness, but of strength, I think, and also a commitment that I give thanks to for this place, Trinity. And I have no doubt that that same level of commitment was found in, in anything and everything that Irwin took on, whether it be his courses and classes, running, uh, all the things, and I can't even begin to list all the things that Irwin was engaged in, but I'm sure that same level of commitment was there. And I give thanks for that. And uh, it took a little while, but I don't know if Irwin continued to work behind the scenes, but eventually I got here to Trinity, and I, I give thanks for that as well. The relationships that were shared in this place, and with Irwin was one of them. And of course, people of faith proclaim that there is an ultimate promise that is ours through Jesus Christ, and that is of a life that is beyond this world. A life that is set free, as we heard about from Revelation, free from pain, free from suffering, free from the, the decay that our body takes on in this world where we are set free into a freedom and a joy that will last for all eternity. And I rejoice in that, that Erwin is already celebrating in that. And that, I hope, also can temper some of our sorrow, some of our grief, and that we can trust that that same promise is there for us. So if you are finding yourself wound up this day or in the days that lie ahead, remember that there is a shepherd who knows where green pastures lie, who knows where the still waters are, where you can find refreshment for your soul. And in that moment, I promise you, he will be there. And may God make it so. Amen. Irwin has a remarkable legacy. Uh, there's only a slight snippet of that on your memorial folder, and anybody who has known Irwin in any way knows all of the things that Irwin helped come into be in this world, but he also brought children, and through them, grandchildren into this world who are also a special blessing and a gift. Uh, and I'm going to call upon one of them now, and I would ask Eric to come forward. Thank you to Pastor Mark for his kind words and uh, support to the last week. And also thank you to all of you for being here today. Your support is very much appreciated by all of us. My name's Eric, and uh, I feel very lucky to be one of Erwin's grandchildren. And uh, I want to take a little while just to reflect on some memories of the time that I spent with him. One of my earliest memories with Opa is him teaching me algebra on the drive back to Calgary after a summer visit in Saskatoon. He was a brilliant teacher and mathematician who inspired a love of teaching that runs through my whole family, myself included. And the fact that he managed to engage eight or nine year old me with algebra should be all the proof of that that you need. I also remember going for runs with him in, in his hometown of Stilbach in Germany. He was an avid runner, and uh, we had some, some great, great talks on those runs where he, he showed me his love for the scenic beauty of his hometown and, and showed me how to appreciate the, the feeling of a good run. 
Hi, my name is He told me stories, and, and one of them was about being the only English speaker in this town when American soldiers came at the end of the Second World War, and how he was able to communicate with them and, and help them, and, and even form something close to friendship with some of them. And he was able to speak English because he was the only person in his little town to go to high school and, and, and also to university, which still blows my mind. I wouldn't be here without his determination and drive. It seems like he was always motivated to find more, always motivated to provide the best life he could for his family. Playing cards once, he told me, vanished box, danished gewinnt, which translates roughly to he who doesn't bet will never win. And there's a second part to that statement, which goes, vanished heiratet kriegt ein Kind, which translates to he who doesn't marry won't get a child, but he assured me that he couldn't really guarantee the second half of his time. Kevin <laughs> was one of the most kind, gentle, and understanding people that I'll ever know. He was well loved by everyone who knew him, and was a dependable support whenever we needed one. I'll always treasure the memory of him playing me to sleep on the piano as a child. He inspired me to take up the piano, and one of the first times that I really felt connected to the instrument was when I was playing on the piano at, at his and my own's house. I think that this today is, is what he would want, an opportunity for all of us to love and care for each other, to remember him through our words and our music, and hopefully at the reception later, a chance to eat some smelly cheese. <laughs> Um, I'd like to leave you with Beethoven's Sonata Pathetic, Opus 13, Second Movement.
indeed, music doth have charms. Wunderbar. Thank you. We continue to give heart and voice to music. I invite you to rise as we join together when peace like a river. By his resurrection, he has opened the kingdom of heaven to all those who turn to him. 
So make us certain that because he lives, we also shall live, and that neither death, nor life, nor things present, nor things to come, nothing in all of creation can separate us from your love, which is ours in Jesus Christ our Lord. And so now, as he has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This time I would invite the community to be seated once again. We have more stories to be told. I know there are more that we can share at this time, but we would invite the other grandchildren, Stephen, Adrian, and Jessica, to come forward at this time. Instances that stick out. 
Some of the stories that I really loved were when Oma and Uncle would sit down with us, and usually over dinner, and tell us stories about life in Germany as a child, or life during the war, or how they met and fell in love. These stories were always very cooperative and collaborative effort on their part, with Oma and Oba each taking turns telling their sides of the story. They were our role models for how to lovingly share a life with each other, even while doing something as simple as telling us stories. Probably my favorite Oba story, though, is the one where he told me about how Bluewurst is made. For those of you who don't know, Bluewurst is a type of German sausage, um, which in English is called blood tongue sausage. Um, my Oma and Opa always had some in their fridge while we were growing up, and it was a really big hit among the grandkids. One day, I was over for lunch at Oma and Opa's place, and naturally, I had a blue whist sandwich. Opa began telling me about how when he was young, for a while, they kept fig pigs at the family house. Um, and he proceeded to tell me in detail, um, <laughs> while I was eating my sandwich, all about how those pigs were slaughtered to make blue roast. <laughs> Neither of us really thought anything strange about the scenario, and we carried on with our lunch, having an excellent and informative conversation about where blue roast came from. <laughs> um, growing up, Oma and Opa also wanted to make sure that we were pre prepared for life. So whether that meant teaching us cross-country skiing, or making us try new things like skinny dipping for our first time at the Hutton's Cottage. <laughs> there were also a few specific tools that they believed were important for success. One was a really good watch, and right now I'm wearing the watch that Oma and Opa bought for me in Hawaii. Opa in particular, however, always had one tool that he kept with him at all times, and that was his Swiss Army knife. He really believed that this was an important tool to own, and even in his dementia, when it was getting more pronounced, he became, or he made sure, doubly sure that um, he gave me a Smith Army knife. And he did this by doing so on two separate occasions, just in case he forgot. <laughs> so, he wanted to make absolutely sure that I would not go through life without a trusty pocket knife that would serve me as well as, as, well as it had served him. As Opa went on, or uh, as time went on, Opa didn't do as much talking, but we communicated in other ways. For us, that meant dancing in the living room after dinner, and each lip licking a whipped cream off of one of the beaters as dessert was being prepared. It also meant switching from having a beer together to having a root beer together as his taste changed with age. It was the little things. It was the extra tight hugs before he left to go home, or sharing a meaningful bond. No matter what was going on in life, what barriers we encountered, we always knew that he cared. And even if it wasn't verbal at the end, it didn't have to be. He just knew. Well, I am really grateful for the time that I've spent remembering Opa with my family. These past few days have reminded me of memories that I forgot that I had. I remember him teaching me how to serve in table tennis. I remember going running with him and my mom. I remember playing chess with him once and being so proud when the game ended with a tie. Uh, looking back, I'm fairly certain that he was going easy on me. There's really no way that Ova couldn't have beaten ten-year-old me if he really wanted to. But he let the game end with a tie, letting me believe that I was pretty good at chess. Until, of course, I played it again with someone else. <laughs> I'm the youngest of the grandchildren by about three years. As a child, I sort of assumed that Opa would be around forever. And by the time I was old enough to realize that this wouldn't be the case, his dementia had already progressed quite a bit. So when I visited him in the nursing home last summer, I was desperate to connect with him in any way possible. Thankfully, it was much easier than I thought it would be. Even then, Opa still had a sense of humor and he would be constantly pointing things out that we could laugh about together. That's something that I'll always admire about him, and something that I'll always aspire to. I love the way that he would make silly faces, or reframe a conversation with a wink of his eye. I love the resilience of his spirit. I love the way that his compassion and his intellect could combine in a way that would make it so easy to connect with him, both when I was a young child, and then again later 
as an adult. Thank you. Thank you so very much for sharing that. I know that isn't always easy, but you you honor Europa with your words and your tribute. Thank you for that. Now I will call Erwin's children, Felix and Katya. Not so much the math part, though. 
Another example of what we admired him for, and it's, it's a small thing, but it's one we both remember 40, more than 40 years later. It happened on a family camping trip or maybe a little fishing trip up north, and quite far up north that time. And we went past the ranch, I think we went as far as Zadaraptis. And at uh, some remote gas station up, I think, close to La Ronge, as I remember it, uh, sort of in the middle of nowhere, um, there was a, a, what looked like a stray dog that had lost an argument with a porcupine and had a, you know, a snout full of quills and was obviously in a great deal of distress. And sort of my, it was a big dog, my initial instinct would be to keep some distance. Um, my father, on the other hand, somehow managed to get close to the dog and inspired the dog's trust. And, uh, and even though he knew it would hurt the dog, pull out a quill, at which point the dog gave a yelp and ran away. Um, didn't bite him, which was good, and came, but came back not very long later for, uh, for another one to be pulled, and this repeated a few times until I think he had most of it out. Mom and Dad were married for 57 years. The slides that you saw at the beginning and that we will also show at the reception speak to what a team they were. On the positive side, their team approach to just about everything and their closeness and their loyalty for each other set a wonderful example for us. On the negative side, when we were younger and tried to work one against the other to get our way, it invariably failed. So, but let's face it, along with the good memories, there are going to be some that aren't so good. In fact, uh, I can think of a few that were really quite unpleasant and embarrassing. I'll tell you about a couple of those. Um, I have one is when I was 17, we were visiting uh, Germany for my grandparents' 50th uh, wedding anniversary. And somehow I let my father convince, cajole, or guilt me into going for a run with him uh, around the village, kind of like what Eric was describing earlier. And this was ro rolling hills and uh, paths through those. And I mean, I was 17 and had some pride, and I wasn't really wanting to admit that my father, who was like my old man of pushing late 40s, uh, was someone I couldn't keep up with. And uh, I don't know, I, was, I don't know how I managed to somehow straggle along and not have a coronary in the process. But somehow it wasn't fun at all, I can tell you. It was a bit embarrassing. And, and actually, we had a replay after that. It took a while before we tried that stunt again that I did, but we were in Hawaii, and um, Katya and I, our families were there. And we agreed to go for a run with him because when he was there, he'd always run around Diamond Head from Waikiki Beach. Quite a long run, and again, there's some hill involved. And um, I guess Katya had trained for this, but I didn't, and I was a smoker at the time. And, um, but there, off we went, and uh, and again, I wasn't sure there at times whether I was going to see the end of that holiday or not, um, but uh, I did. Uh, again, it wasn't much fun, but in some ways it was worthwhile. Um, and Eric, well, I guess he told you his story, but I mean, uh, I think, as I understand it, you had some trouble keeping up with him too, when you were at that time you were 13 and he was, I think, 75, so he was quite the runner. <laughs> Marathon running is a good metaphor for how Dad lived his life. It wasn't a sprint. It wasn't even a race. It was a chance to enjoy the activity and connect with and care for the people surrounding him. What was important to Dad was having time for family and friends. Almost all of Ingrid and Irwin's holidays involved traveling to spend time with family and friends, so much so that they even took Irwin's mother to Hawaii with them when she was over 90. Dad valued his rural roots in Germany, and he passed the love of these roots on to his children and grandchildren. A few years ago, he wrote a poem that shows his love of family, home, and his roots. As written, only the last verse has a heading, and the heading is returning home. We will end our eulogies using Dad's own words, as translated from German by us, and as read by my husband, Larry. Schleber. 
In Schlierbach, I'm at home. During my morning walk through the mist shrouded forest, I am accompanied by old memories. Sunday strolls, 50 years ago with my parents. Who takes Sunday strolls anymore? There are still the same paths, rocks, trees. Being at home, waking up in the house where I was born, where in the summer night as a child I lay awake and listened to my family celebrate as grandfather played the piano and everyone sang. <coughs> I searched among my father's tools, of which he was proud. But now everything is rusted. Yet when I look up, there he stands before me at his workbench, holding a chisel. So much is different now. The little train no longer runs. The pottery factory no longer sets the rhythm of the day with its whistle. The cozy warmth of the wood fire no longer lives in the houses. Still, behind the veil of the present, the old village lives on. The forces that have shaped me still remain. Here, I am home. Returning home is like a dream that becomes real. The landscape emerges from the fog, overwhelming you with a blaze of color. Uh, Ingrid and I think some of the family are going to linger for a moment in the narthex. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, if you cannot come and be with them there, they will have a moment to invite you to come and, and uh, just share a moment with them if you would like. Uh, but we ask that you respect a bit of time and that if you can keep it under uh, one to two minutes perhaps so that we can ensure that we are able to move on with our day. Again, thank you on behalf of the family for being here. May the Lord bless you uh, in, uh, in your remembering and thank you. Uh, now I invite you please to rise. Let us conclude our time together with our sending hymn, Amazing Grace. <laughs>